Welcome everyone this morning to Silver Birch's morning service from Bangor today the 24th of May. Despite everything we are very blessed to have the freedom to worship God not just in the building but as you're doing this morning in your own home over the internet. As someone once said the church is the people not the steeple. I've noticed that surveys taken over the past weeks suggest that many times more people are going to church online than ever have in recent years in a building. The Guardian newspaper actually reports that one in four people have tuned in to a religious service recently, which I just find mind-boggling. Our experience in Silver Birch is that our online numbers are about treble that of what a attendance would be on a normal Sunday morning. I think that many people are looking for hope right now and maybe you are one of these people. There's a verse in the Bible from the book of Exodus that's been in my heart all this week and I'd like to share it with you right now. It's found in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 27. And these words I think are as relevant today as when they were written over three and a half thousand years ago by Moses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. This morning, as we sing, read the Bible and hear Glenn preach, let us bow our heads together before the Lord, our Creator and our Saviour. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your holy presence. We bow our heads in reverence and awe and come and worship to you. We give thanks for your plan revealed to us in the scriptures to send your Son to redeem us and bring salvation when he died for us on the cross at Calvary. Lord, may we appreciate the freedom and privilege that we have to be able to come together and to worship, pray, sing and to hear your word. Our Father, we know that you know the needs of every one of us today. We ask you to bring comfort and assurance and strength and bring among us right now into our homes a real sense of your holy presence. We ask that you may use Glenn's message to touch lives. For everyone who is searching for the hope that only you can give, we pray this morning that they might find that hope and salvation as they put their trust in you. In the name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, history seems to have a way of repeating itself. I was interested to have a look at what happened over the years on the day, the 24th of May. 231 years ago, on this day, in the year 1689, Parliament in Westminster passed an act, the Toleration Act. And this act gave people like you and me, ordinary people, the freedom to have their own places of worship all across the UK. I think that's amazing. And then, just last year, believe it or not, on this very day, after all the traumas of Brexit, our Prime Minister Theresa May announced her formal resignation the day after Boris Johnson won the Conservative leadership. Well, little did he know what lay ahead. This morning, Glenn Johnson will be bringing to us from the book of John in chapter 4 a life-changing conversation that Jesus had with another politician 2,000 years ago. But before that, we've got something special for you. We are delighted to share a great song performed in isolation by members of the New Irish Youth Choir. I hope that it's a real encouragement to you.
The Meeting with the Politician John chapter 4 verse 46 So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him Unless you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked him the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. And God has promised to bless the reading of his inspired word. Hello to the church family at Silver Birch. Thank you again for the invitation and the opportunity to share with you on your online Sunday service. And to friends and family who may be watching and other people who have just stumbled across this particular YouTube channel. Uh, it's great, it's my privilege to be able to share with you. Um, I, I, that's not something I take lightly. Actually, I appreciate the privilege and also the responsibility of opening the word of God and trying to say something. And actually my prayer is that God would say something to you this morning. God would speak to you this morning. I've been asked to continue the series you've been looking at over the last number of weeks, Conversations with Jesus. And just in my preparation for this week, I thought about uh, some verses in Psalm 115. And as we think about this idea, Conversations with Jesus, the words of Jesus and how they impacted people, what a great truth that we have a God who speaks. And here is the reverse of that. As the psalmist looks at idols in the lives of people, false gods that they put their trust and their faith in. And this is what he writes. Psalm 115 verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. They have feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. These gods, these false gods, these idols that the people put their trust and their faith in, were completely incapable of having any impact or effect whatsoever into the people's lives who put their trust in them. But this morning we're going to think about a God who cares and who moves and who acts and who speaks clearly. And we're going to look at another conversation that Jesus had. And ask the question, what does that mean to us all these years later? I don't know if you watch Britain's Got Talent. Uh, for a family, it's one of the highlights for the week. We must have a very sad week, but we do enjoy it. On Saturday night, we sit down together and uh, put on Britain's Got Talent. And we watch as all these different acts come on and try and entertain and try and amaze. In the hope of getting through to the next round, ultimately to win Britain's Got Talent. And to appear on the Royal Variety performance and also to get a big check as well but it's interesting how it's developed over the years so a number of years ago one of the first winners were diversity this dance group who were brilliant and also george sampson who was also a dancer but as the series have gone on and the years have gone on dance has become a wee bit more boring now it has to be something really different to impress us and actually when all these little boys and girls come on these wee cute dance trips who several years ago you would have ooed and add. my daughters now are just so bored with them. They can't even be bothered watching them. And when an act comes on to perform a particular dangerous act, quite often afterwards, Simon Cowell, the chief judge, will say, well, yeah, that was good, but if you get back next time, we want more danger, more excitement, more experience. A few weeks ago, if you watched it, there was a guy come on on a unicycle. Uh, so he, he sort of bounced upstairs and all the rest of it. But then he went on this huge, big unicycle. I don't know if it had. It was 30 or 40 feet, maybe even taller than that. And you saw him sort of going around the stage and, you know, panicking, waiting for him just to cope over. He got through, but Simon Cowell said to him, could you go higher? And even though it was amazing what he did, 
we want to see more. We want to be excited. We want to see experience and spectacle. And quite often we become quickly bored whenever something becomes old hat. There's a number of accounts in the Bible of people who wanted to see Jesus doing something. They wanted to be amazed. They wanted to see some sort of spectacle from him. Matthew 12 verse 38 says, Some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus and said, We want to see a miraculous sign from you. They just wanted to see spectacle or experience something dramatic. After Jesus' arrest, he was sent to Herod's palace. And it says Herod was pleased because for some time he had hoped to see Jesus perform a miracle. Again, he wanted to see a spectacle, a miraculous sign. And this is in this account that's already been read to you this morning uh, from John's Gospel. This man arrives, a royal official, and he asks Jesus to come with him and heal his son. And Jesus' reply in verse 48 says, Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. The sad reality, of course, is right the way throughout the scripture. As Jesus performs signs and wonders, miraculous signs and wonders, many people chose not to believe even though they did see those things. The purpose of Jesus' miracles weren't to impress or entertain. They weren't spectacles. There was a clear purpose in these things that Jesus did. And in John chapter 20, towards the end of John's gospel, verses 30 and 31, it says this. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. That's a staggering statement in itself. When you read through John's Gospels, John's Gospel, and you see these miraculous signs that Jesus performed, there are many of them. But towards the end of the book, it states, actually, they're not all recorded. But the ones that are recorded, verse 31 says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus' miracles were signposts pointing towards the reality that he is the Son of God and pointing people to a belief in him and pointing people to life and his promise of life to the full. So what can we learn from this miracle that's been read to us this morning from John's Gospel? When Prince Charles and Boris Johnston were diagnosed with coronavirus very early on in this pandemic, one of the reporters said, this virus is no respecter of status. And this account that's just been read to us this morning, you have a, a royal official from the highest bracket in society coming to Jesus, probably from King Herod's household, a government official or politician. Every day he would rub shoulders with royalty. But illness is no respecter of status. And those of you who are parents know that when our children are sick, We'll do anything we can to bring about restoration to them. And at the point of this man's greatest need, this royal official, this politician, he doesn't go to the king of Judea. As a politician and royal official, he would have had access and he would have had at his disposal the greatest physicians and medical care that was available, albeit quite basic in those days, but he would have had that all available to him freely and readily. But he didn't avail of any of that. He went on this 20 mile journey to see this poor carpenter. And he knew that at the point of his greatest need, he needed to go to the greatest needer of human need, Jesus. And that's exactly what he did. And when he goes on this journey and when he arrives and stands in front of Jesus, he did something that I imagine he did very rarely, if ever, in his life. In verse 47, it says, When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. As a royal official, his life would have been shaped around and guided by protocol and procedure. But when he stands in front of Jesus, that all goes out the window. Because his son is at home dying and he needs help and he begs Jesus. Don't let your pride get in the way of seeking help. One of the other things that we have enjoyed, uh, Heidi, my wife and I, is the Netflix, Netflix series, The Crown. And some of them are very, very powerful. And one in particular, I hope to show you a little clip off. I can't really do that. But I would encourage you to watch this if you have Netflix. It's series three and the episode is called Moon Dust, And it focuses on the Apollo 11 mission where uh, man first walked on the moon. And Prince... Philip is fascinated by this. He's captivated by space travel and 
all the way through or in parts of the episode, you see him sitting watching the TV and he's reading about it. He's excited about this whole aspect of man getting to the moon. It's a passion of his. And towards the start of the episode, a new dean arrives in Windsor. And you see Prince Philip sitting in the church service, completely bored by the previous dean. And then the new dean comes and he invites Prince Philip to come and to meet with him and a group of other men as they discuss faith and philosophy. And he listens for a minute or two and then he just goes on this rant and he's openly dismissive of what these men believe in. And he storms out and leaves them. And then as the episode develops, uh, Prince Philip's mother dies and shortly afterwards he has the opportunity to meet these three astronauts who have gone to the moon on the Apollo 11 mission. And he's like an excited schoolboy. He's like a child on Christmas Eve. He cannot wait to meet these men and, and have a conversation with them. But as he sits in front of them, he's completely underwhelmed. And you just see the sort of excitement just draining out of his body and being replaced by disappointment. And towards the end of the episode, it sees him going back again to the same group of men that he openly disparaged and dismissed towards the start of the episode. And he sits down, having processed a lot of stuff in his own life, and he recounts a conversation he had with his mother shortly before her death, where she said to him, how is your faith? And then in the final scenes of this episode, Prince Philip, in a monologue, in a, in a speech to these men, shares the following. It's very, very powerful. I don't know how accurate it is. There's probably aspects of it. But it, it's very powerful and very moving. And this is what he says. I'm here to admit to you that I've lost my faith. And without it, what is there? The solution to our problems is not in the ingenuity of the rocket or science or technology. The answer is faith. And so having openly ridiculed you for what you're trying to achieve, I now find myself sitting in front of you full of respect and admiration and not a small part of desperation as I come to say, help, help me. Don't let pride or arrogance get in the way of you doing the same, of seeking help. And this royal official in this account in John's Gospel didn't let anything get in the way of seeking help and begging Jesus to help him. And during Jesus' life here, he encountered the poorest in society, outcasts and those most marginalised. He also met the richest and those most highly honoured, respected and coveted, and everyone in between. All of those people had needs, and Jesus knew their individual need, and he met their individual need. He's the most outstanding person in all of human history. Let me read this to you. I love this. It's called One Solitary Life, speaking about Jesus. It says, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to university. He never visited a big city. He never travelled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. And when he was only 33, his friends ran away. One of them denied knowing him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central human or central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Jesus came to impact this world. A simple, humble man in so many respects, but the very God of heaven come to earth, the most extraordinary person that's lived in all of human history. And the first thing I want you to notice about this account of a royal official coming to Jesus is that Jesus is completely impartial. It doesn't matter who you are. 
It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what job you do. It doesn't matter what house you live in. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past, etc., etc., etc. Jesus is interested in you. He wants to meet your greatest need. And that's why he came to this world. And that's what he's in the business of doing. Secondly, what I want you to notice is the tremendous faith of this royal official, this politician who comes and stands in front of Jesus. There's a phrase used there that whenever Jesus said to him, go, your son is well, it says he took Jesus at his word. He listened to what he said. He exercised, exercised faith and belief and he took Jesus at his word. Can you imagine that? <laughs> your child's at home dying. You're completely desperate. Jesus doesn't come to the house. He simply says, go, he's well. And this man took Jesus at his word. That requires incredible faith and belief. A couple of years ago, uh, I was asked to speak at Queen's University. They were having an outreach event, the Christian Union. Uh, so on a Monday evening, they had a table quiz and I was invited at the end of it to speak for 15 minutes. And this is the title. What is the meaning of life, the universe and everything else? That's quite a topic for 15 minutes. So I gave the presentation. Uh, I talked about how I believe that Jesus or that God is the author of life, that Jesus came to bring about restoration again and, and that ultimately God created this world and he is the author of life. He, he brings meaning to life through a relationship with his son, Jesus. During my presentation, there was on the screen behind me a, a mobile number and all the way through, the students could text in any questions that they had. And as soon as I finished, Someone come up on stage and say, we've got some questions for you now, Glenn. And they just rattled out this list of questions. It's probably one of the most terrifying things and one of the most uncomfortable things that I've ever done. But as I tried to answer these questions, I made the point to the students that night that as much evidence as there is in the Bible and in the world, actually, for the existence of God and that he brings purpose and meaning to life. And it's important and vital, actually, to examine that evidence. But the bottom line is, and I said to them, this is not a cop-out, but the bottom line is, ultimately, it requires faith. It requires us as individuals to examine that evidence and to make a choice individually about that and to exercise faith. Last week, I said that genuine faith requires both fact and faith. And the official had to weigh up the little he knew about Jesus as he stood in front of him. The facts that he had about this man, listen to the words that he said, but ultimately he had to exercise faith and trust and belief that what Jesus said in fact happened, that his son would be healed. What about you? I don't know how much you know about Jesus. I don't know how much you know about his life and about what the Bible teaches. For some of you, it might be very little. For some of you, a lot. But ultimately, what you need to allow to happen is whatever you know, however much that is, which is up in here in your brain, it has to make a small geographical shift and move from here into your heart. You have to exercise faith. You have to trust him. And as you listen to what Jesus said and examine his life, you have to allow that to impact your own personal individual life and examine who he was, but to exercise faith and trust and acceptance. So the first point is Jesus is completely impartial, came to meet everyone's need. The second point is like this man, we need to exercise faith and trust in what he said and who he is. And then thirdly, Jesus isn't limited by geographical location. This incident took place in Cana in Galilee. And the man came on a journey from Capernaum. That's about 20 miles away or thereabouts. And after this discussion, after Jesus said to him, go your son as well, and the man turned and made his way back again, that long journey by foot, back again to Capernaum, Capernaum where his son was. On the way, he's met by his servants. And I wonder as he saw them in the distance coming, did he have that knot in his stomach? You know that knot you get when you're waiting for news, maybe waiting for exam results or waiting for hospital tests, whatever it may be. There's that, there's that knot, that heaviness, that tightness in your chest. But I imagine as he saw them coming, it completely disappeared quickly. Because they ran and excitedly told him, Master, your son is well. And the man's excited, of course, and elated. But he has the presence of mind to say to them, when did it happen? And their response is, yesterday at the seventh hour, one o'clock in the afternoon, the exact moment that Jesus had said to him, go, your son is well. 
Jesus is not in any way inhibited by geo uh, geography. Many times you see Jesus physically standing, touching someone, healing them, face to face in conversation with them. But in this incident, from about 20 miles away, he has the power to bring about deliverance in the son of this royal official and heal him. He is not limited at all by geography. And it doesn't matter this morning where you are, where you're listening to this message. He is capable of impacting your life if you call out to him and if you ask him and if you exercise faith in him. He wants to meet your greatest need. Last week, after this Samaritan woman had came to Jesus, it says that she ran back to her village. This week you see these men running, these servants running towards their master to tell him the good news. And you see time and again in the Bible how Jesus radically changes situations and brings about this excitement, this, this exuberance. That's what he does. And my encouragement would be to you this morning, or whenever you listen to this little message, is to appreciate he's impartial. He loves you this morning. He cares for you. He came to this world to die on a cross for you, for your sin, for your brokenness, and take the punishment for your rebellion. He's interested in you. You need to exercise faith in him this morning. You need to decide for yourself who he is, what he did, but you ultimately individually need to exercise personal individual faith and trust in him. And appreciate this morning that he, he's not at all inhibited by where you are, by who you are. Where you sit today, he can change your life if you call out to him. And I firmly believe that this morning, if you cry out to him and if you acknowledge him for who he is, for Saviour and Lord and Master, he will answer you and he will bring about a change in your life. Another conversation that brought about a radical change. And again, as I have in previous weeks, I would encourage you this morning to have a conversation with the living God of heaven. What a privilege that we can do that. Not an idol, not someone that's completely incapable, but a living God who through his son Jesus and his Holy Spirit has this communion with us, this relationship with us. And I would encourage you today, now as I have a, a few seconds of silence, just yourself to have this conversation with God. For those of you who are Christians, to again thank him for his work in your life and ask him to work through you. And if you're not a Christian this morning, I would encourage you to respond to him, to exercise faith in him this morning and allow him to bring about a change in your life. So I'm going to be quiet just for a few seconds and allow you just to reflect on what we've heard and allow you to respond in whatever way you want to, uh, to the very God of heaven. And then I'm just going to close in prayer. Thanks again for listening. Let's just have a... a few seconds of reflection before I pray. Father, thank you so much for your lovely son. Thank you that he came to this world. Thank you for the change that he brought into so many situations and lives. Thank you for this conversation with a royal official who exercised great faith in your son. Thank you for the power of Jesus to completely change his son, to heal him and to restore him. Thank you that he's impartial. Thank you that he helped every single person that he met, irrespective of social background. And thank you that he still does the same. He meets our greatest need and longs to do that. Help us to exercise faith in him. And thank you that you are not incapable of helping us because of where we are, wherever that is in terms of geography, but also wherever it is in terms of our individual personal lives. Thank you that you long to help us if we cry out to you. And I pray that'll be the case this morning. Thank you for your word. I pray you'll speak through it and speak into the very hearts and lives and minds of people who are tuning into this service. Bring about change, we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Let me encourage you to get in touch with some of the folk at Silverbirds. You can do that through their Facebook page or if you know them personally. Uh, have a chat with them. Uh, and let me encourage you just to seek God, to, to call out to him, to exercise faith in him. And for those of, of you who know him, to live for him. Thank you again for this opportunity to be able to share with you this morning. Have a great day. God bless you. In Christ alone. 
my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I stand there in the ground his body lay Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand Thank you Glenn for bringing God's word to us this morning from the Gospel of John I love that hymn that we've just sung in Christ alone my hope is found. The only hope that you and I have for time and all eternity is found in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God's people looked forward in hope to a time when the Messiah would come. And God used the Feast of Passover both to remind them of how he had brought them out of Egypt, but also of, as a picture of the Lamb of God who would one day come and die for our sins. Listen to Moses speak in the book of Exodus chapter 12 verses 21 to 27 about the Passover. You shall observe this Passover as a statute for you and for your sons forever and when you come to the land that the Lord will give you and he has promised you shall keep this Passover service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, 
for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. At every Passover meal, a child asks four questions about what Passover means. And the parents answer the child, passing on the knowledge from generation to generation. It's an interesting fact that the Jewish festival of Passover is actually the oldest continually observed religious act in the world. But perhaps you've had the same conversation or thought and wondered about communion. What does communion mean? Very simply, the Lord Jesus wants us to remember what he did for us when he died on the cross. And the bread and the wine are symbols reminding us that he gave his life so your sins and my sins could be forgiven. Let's bow our heads together and pray, giving thanks for the bread and wine. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your holy presence in reverence and humility. We acknowledge that we are unworthy of your love and forgiveness. In Christ alone, our hope is found. He is our hope, our strength, our song. And it is only through our faith in him and what he has done that we are forgiven. We give you thanks for your grace and for your love for us that led you to send your son Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross of Calvary. We give thanks now for the bread and wine in obedience to your command in the scriptures that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup we proclaim the Lord's death till he come. The bread reminds us of our Saviour's perfect life and body broken for us and the wine a reminder of his blood shed when he died for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we really would look forward to you coming again to hear as we continue our studies in John next Sunday morning. May God bless you all throughout this week. Goodbye.